Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to the Edmund J. Stafford Center for Ethics and our public conversations. We are delighted this evening to have Lawrence Ralph with us, as well as Ronnie Hirsch, who will help moderate the conversation with all of you. To cue that up now, let me just remind you that you can put questions in the chat function right from the beginning of the conversation. So don't hesitate. Um, don't wait, jump in with your questions. But here at the Edmund J. Stafford Center for Ethics, we work very hard to build conversations about pressing public questions, always asking those who engage with us to keep questions of ethics and values at the forefront of consideration. And it's my great pleasure tonight that we have both Lawrence and Ronnie with us. Lawrence is a professor of anthropology at Princeton University. He has published a powerful book called Renegade Dreams, Living Through Injury in Gangland, Chicago. That was his first book in 2014, and now just out a truly extraordinary book, the one we'll talk about tonight, called Torture Trees, Police Violence from Chicago to the War on Terror. Ronnie Hirsch received her PhD in political science at UCLA, and she's with us this year as a fellow at the Edmund J. Saver Center for Ethics, working on questions of political economy and justice. So Ronnie, thanks for being here. I know you're gonna disappear for a little bit and you'll come back for the, for, to moderate uh, Q&A with the audience, but we really appreciate your doing that for us. Thank you. Um, Lawrence, um, coming back to you, I was lucky to read your book um, in its galleys form and was so moved by it. It's one of the most powerful books um, I've read in an incredibly long time. And I wanna just say to start to sort of tell everybody who's listening that um, it really starts from cases of torture in the Chicago police force, and Lawrence will tell us more about that. Um, but Lawrence, um, through close ethnographic work, um, wrote a book um, structured through letters, series of letters to different people who play a role in how Chicago administers justice, those who experience the administration of justice, those who are responsible for administering it. And it results in one of the most profound frameworks for thinking about how we administer justice in this country that I've ever come across. Um, we will start by talking to Lawrence about his book, um, hearing more about it, and then um, toward the end of the conversation, engage in the specific question of how the COVID crisis is also affecting issues of policing and justice. But Lawrence, I'd like to start by inviting you to introduce your book to us. Um, please, over to you, and then I will have some, some questions for you. Thanks so much, Danielle, and thanks for uh, inviting me to have this conversation and for the really generous and kind words about the book. Um, so for me, uh, the way that I think about this book is that it's part of a, a larger movement. It's part of a movement uh, across the U.S. to talk about the role of policing in American cities. And in particular, it's part of a movement in Chicago to talk about the ramifications of a police torture scandal that took place um, for about 50 years in which uh, African-American men were tortured in police custody. And the reason why this topic really struck me had to do with my first book, which was on gang violence. And whenever I was talking to people about urban violence and gang violence, the issue of policing was a, a hot button topic and the issue of policing came up. But in Chicago, it was always linked to John Burge and these torture cases. And so the idea was that if Burge had never been held accountable and if everybody knew that he had tortured hundreds of people and nothing had ever been done, then why would anything happen now? And so that was a, a profound statement on the uh, lack of accountability and the lack of legitimacy that people had in the police. And so I knew this was a topic that was bigger than what I was going to tackle in Renegade Dreams. And so I dedicated the next book for dealing with the history of that torture and the ramifications of police torture today. Thanks a lot. So um, let me start by actually about the structure of the books. I think it's really important for people to know um, how you went about um, really kind of inventing a new form of book um, to talk about this problem in Chicago. Um, the book is a series of letters. Can you just sort of walk people through uh, who the addressees are for the letters that you write and 
uh, what you were trying to do with the kind of different perspectives that you engaged with in the different sort of series of letters? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. So first I would say that as an anthropologist, I always uh, come to a research project thinking about the best way to convey the ideas and to convey the message. And that's always rooted in the way that the people that I'm talking to experience the problem. And so when I was talking to people in Chicago about police violence and the history of police violence and torture in particular, in particular I came across certain limitations of how academic writing usually takes place. It usually takes place um, in terms of an expert explaining a problem to a general audience. And that was inadequate for a couple of reasons. One was that the people who I, were talk to, who I was talking to about this problem knew that torture had been an open secret and that people knew about these cases. It's just that no one believed them. And so I wasn't discovering this phenomenon. I was just helping to um, talk about the consequences and the implications of torture. And another issue came with the topic of torture itself. I mean, torture is so hard to describe and it's so hard to talk about that it can easily veer off into voyeurism. So I thought a lot about what makes something voyeuristic. And eventually I realized that it has a lot to do with who the presumed audience is for that message. When I was traveling across Chicago and listening to the torture survivors tell their stories in public settings, I noticed that it never seemed voyeuristic. And that was because they had a particular purpose for telling their story. They were telling their story a lot of times to younger generations so that something like this wouldn't happen to them. They were telling it in the context of legal cases so that they could get a, a, a settlement or adjudication or um, get reparations for police torture. They were telling it to the media so that their, what happened to them could be believed. And so I thought about, a lot about who I was telling the story to. And letters became a crucial way for me to keep the message of the book clear and make sure that I was always uh, intentional about the particular um, aspects of torture that I was describing at any given moment. So I ended up writing to public school students because a lot of the torture survivors wanted the next generation to know about what happened to them. I ended up writing to um, the future mayor of Chicago um, because a lot fell through the cracks in terms of the structure of governance in Chicago. And I ended up writing to police officers who had experienced uh, torture in their precinct but didn't end up uh, saying anything about it. So the letters are incredibly powerful. And as you said, there's the mayor, there are police officers, they're directed to students. Um, let's back up for a minute now and just introduce everybody again to the specific contours of what happened in Chicago. And then we can dive into the logic, your account of the logic for what happened. So you, can you just walk people through a kind of basic picture? The years covered, the number of people who it's been documented were in fact tortured. Um, torture is forms range from electrocution to um, forms of rape. Um, so, but the more important thing is really for you to just give us a sense of the, the shape of what actually happened in Chicago. Sure. So, um, beginning in the 1970s until uh, in the early 1990s, uh, we know that uh, over 200 uh, black men were tortured in police custody uh, by John Burge and uh, officers that he commanded in his precinct. Um, that number is admittedly conservative because it's limited to the Burge cases. Um, since that time, 
there's been a torture uh, relief commission instituted in Illinois, the first in the country, and hundreds of claims uh, have been coming in each year since uh, that re the relief commission was instituted. And so we know that this, these torture cases expand beyond Burge and they expand beyond that particular precinct. But um, the reason why the, the Burge cases are important be is because it's tied to the efforts within the Chicago activist community to gain reparations for the torture survivors. And so in um, 2015, um, Chicago became the city, first city in the country to have reparations awarded to them uh, because of a historical injustice. And this was a landmark decision because uh, usually when it comes to police violence and police settlements, those settlements are individualistic. And so a, cert, a particular person might get in a settlement and that settlement often comes with a stipulation that they can no longer talk about what happened to them. And in this case, uh, the reparations ordinance was landmark because it was a collective uh, judgment. And what it instituted were uh, a number of collective concessions throughout the city. One was that the history of Chicago police torture be taught in Chicago public schools in, in the eighth grade and the 10th grade. Another concession was that uh, a torture center be built so that victims of police violence, not just related to these cases, but any victim of police violence can um, get counseling and free, uh, free way uh, to process their grief and pain. Um, it also uh, awarded a monetary settlement for 57 of the Burge related victims who hadn't uh, gotten settlements before. And so um, what I wanted to do was to add an academic lens to part of the collective movement to talk about reparations in Chicago. We have lawyers um, like Flint Taylor, who wrote, also wrote a, a great book called The Torture Machine about the history of these cases. We have torture survivors themselves who have written great books about their individual experiences. But I wanted to talk about the shape and the structure of police torture and the, the implications it has for the future. So that's perfect. So that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about uh, next was um, the work that you do to really explain the logic of police torture and the case you make, the argument you make that um, we've all um, relied for too long on, in essence, the sort of the bad apple argument that, oh yes, there's a sort of act of torture here and act of torture there, but it's always a bad apple. And what you have to do is discipline the bad apple and that's how you deal with torture. And you make a completely different kind of case. Um, you really put together all the pieces of police culture and governance at the city level, kind of silences and willingness to look away, all of which combine into a system that made systematic torture possible. Um, I think you use a metaphor of, a, of roots and a tree uh, to describe how it all fits together. Can you? walk us through the logic that you see that makes it possible for a system of justice, in fact, to sustain torture over time as an intrinsic part of what it does? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, a key way to explain that is through the idea of the open secret. And so what's interesting about an open secret is that it's not just that um, people don't know something and, and, and then it's uh, kept secret, it's that people feel that even if they talk about it, even if they talk about what they've experienced, it won't be believed. And it's similar to um, what's going on in, in terms of the Me Too movement, in terms of the structure of power in which for a long time, people know about these things that are going on and they know um, certain actors that are taking place, uh, that are, are engaged in, in, in these illicit acts, but there's also a whole structure that protects them. And so when I talk about the torture tree, 
I'm talking about the entire structure of governance that protects a police officer like John Burge uh, from facing any form of sanction. And this is because when someone uh, has been tortured in police custody and then they explain to the district attorney that they've been tortured, that district attorney wants to close the case and so would believe the police officer as opposed to the, the torture victim. Uh, because of that, then judges have the incentive to believe the district attorney and acts of torture get silenced. But not only that, over time, these same people within governments move through uh, a career ladder. And so the district attorney who heard people claim to be tortured when he or she was a district, district attorney eventually becomes a judge. And when that person becomes a judge, then they don't listen to any cases involving torture or they become a politician. And when they become a politician, they uh, ignore the activism that's going around uh, the cases of torture. And this is the story of torture in Chicago. You can very easily trace the networks of people in particular positions over time. And it's easy to see why uh, torture becomes an open secret for as long as it did. And so on the one hand, I want to show the open secrecy that uh, sustains something like police torture. But on the other hand, uh, another concept that I talk about is a continuum of police violence that connects everyday instances of police abuse to torture. And so when you talk to uh, Chicagoans about police torture, it's very easy for them to understand how it can happen because they're harassed on the streets daily, particularly in, in communities of color. And when they go to court and tell uh, judges about how they were harassed, how they were stopped and frisked, they're not believed either. And in the moment that they're harassed on the street, uh, they believe that at any moment, uh, that that violence in being inflicted on them can escalate. And so it can span from a stop and frisk to torture or death very quickly. And so for me, when I'm talking to people about these things, it easily goes back and forth along a continuum for from everyday forms of harassment to what we would see as extreme cases of violence like torture and death. And so where the concepts really come together, the open secret concept and the specter of the continuum of violence concept is in the way in which truth claims um, and epistemic power, you know, we sort of say in the world of philosophy and so forth, epistemic justice issues and so forth um, intersect. So in other words, harassment isn't just about the actual physical encounter. It's also about the degree to which it enters into the certified record um, of the judicial system. And it's the movement between claims of truth and certification um, in a system where there's a whole lot of work also being done um, that replicates um, injustice over time. That seems like one of the really important um, takeaways from your book. Um, I wanna invite you to share an animation that you've done of the opening section of the book. So we've talked a little bit about how the, the book is structured as a series of letters and the first letter is to um, Chicago Public School kids. And so, um, and, and you've animated it and it's a beautiful, um, extraordinary thing. So I would love to show that to everybody um, and then come back to the conversation. Okay, it's, it's about three minutes, I think, is that right? Yeah, it's about three minutes long. Okay. Episode one, an open letter to the boy and girl with matching airbrush book bags on the corner of Lawndale Avenue and Cermak Road. I began to worry about police violence in Chicago back in the summer of 2004. That's when I saw you 
on your knees at the corner of South Lawndale Avenue and West Cermak Road. I know you're much older now, and yet, when I see black and brown teenagers of today's Chicago, I always flash back to that scene over a decade ago. Four police cars were parked along the curb. Six officers frisked you. Your bags were both white, each with a different word airbrushed in graffiti letters. Your names, I assumed, though I couldn't make them out from where I stood. I had moved to your city two weeks prior to this incident. I remember feeling afraid that I was witnessing an altercation with the police that I too might eventually have. At the same time, I was afraid because I was seeing the past. When I was around the same age as you were then, I found myself in a similar position. My two older brothers and I had just moved from Baltimore to Columbia, Maryland. We decided to go to the mall. Before long, we realized a plainclothes police officer was following us from store to store. The man eventually ordered us to stop. He frisked both of my brothers, who were 15 and 16, against the rail on the second floor. The cop took my eldest brother, Wale, through one of those doors that you never notice along the corridors of a mall until all of your senses are heightened and you start to notice everything. It would take four long hours for Wale to be released. When the police released you, I felt a similar kind of relief as I felt then. But I also felt the familiar combination of anger, frustration, and yes, fear. I cannot change the anger and frustration and fear you must have felt. All I can say is that if I could press rewind and go back to the moment that you two were released, this time I would say a few words. It was not your fault that you were stopped by the police. I know they probably suggested it was, but those accusations are just a way of concealing the open secret. The open secret is this. The kind of police harassment you faced has grown into torture and has even resulted in death, all because the police's use of force is rooted in fear. So I just think that's such a beautiful, powerful um, animation. Thank you for it. Um, I'm really curious to know what kinds of responses to your letters you've gotten. So when you, for example, wrote to uh, members of the police who were adjacent participants in torture or conflicted about seeing and not seeing or wanting to speak up and that makes like African-American police, for example, who were, um, who knew, but but also were themselves vulnerable to discipline inside the force, uh, or when you wrote to the mayor. Um, have you what have you gotten response um, about these, or have, has it opened up conversations for you? Yeah, well, the responses have been kind of hit or miss, and so early on, I realized that it probably would be like that, and I probably wouldn't um, get a lot of responses. Uh, to the people that I wanted to address. And so part of what I did was that I uh, convened groups of Chicagoans to read and discuss the letters as I was writing them. And so um, while I didn't necessarily get responses from particular police officers that I was writing to, I did get responses from Chicago police officers about the things that they experience uh, on the force and some of the challenges that they face. Um, there were a couple of occasions where I did get responses in terms of um, the activist community that I write to in the book. And that was very powerful, not only because it helped clarify um, some of the struggles that they were going to going through in the moment, in terms of how that they were um, trying to address the problems of police violence. But it just added another layer of uh, depth and texture. And so in the book, I, I actually include some of those exchanges uh, with some of the people who did answer the letters. 
And so I think in the book as a whole, when you see all the letters together, uh, it's powerful because it kind of gets at the facet of the problem from multiple uh, directions, from the person on the street who's being harassed to the person who spent decades of their life in prison, to the person who um, is trying to see that uh, something like that can never happen again. And, and so it becomes a dialogue uh, in and of itself. Right. Yeah, yes, that's really powerful. So here we are, and you wrote a book that was part of a criminal justice reform um, movement, a local one in Chicago, um, with the particular issue of reparations for torture in Chicago, but also a much broader um, criminal justice reform movement that's both about incarceration, experiences of people while they're incarcerated, and about policing. Then COVID-19 hits. And um, it seems in so many ways that it has simultaneously accelerated reform um, with efforts to get incarcerated people out or make sure that people who are um, being held in sort of pretrial ways aren't being held in facilities. But at the same time, the response has been insufficient to the number of people who are incarcerated and um, sort of caught with COVID. There's also the, the challenge of policing in the time of COVID and the ways in which that's changing some communities, um, recognizing that physical forms of policing are not you know, helpful to anybody's health, including the police at this point in time, and therefore finally sort of lightening um, the touch for the first time, other communities not uh, registering that on the health point of view. Um, you work more broadly on policing in addition to the specific work you've done um, in Chicago. So are you tracking um, the way in which um, COVID is impacting um, policing? And can you, can you give us any insight into how that is changing now? Yes, um, I think uh, part of what you're highlighting is the fact that uh, what COVID is doing is um, kind of putting a spotlight on the social inequalities that exist in society. And on the one hand, uh, there, we see now uh, that there is the capacity to address these issues in a way that, um, you know, the activist community has been um, clamoring for, for a long time in terms of we can actually address uh, some of these issues of pretrial detention. We can actually um, uh, work on um, even the fact of um, something like stop and frisk and, and the need for, for police now to be uh, constantly aware of how they interact in communities and the effects that their presence has on literally the people who they touch every day. And so uh, COVID is uh, showing that we can uh, amend the way that policing takes place in society. Uh, yet and still, um, there is at the same time, It's, it's highlighting the fissures that already exist and, and, and it's um, raising new questions about vulnerability and the way that our vulnerability is shared. Uh, what I worry about is that um, when you're dealing with populations who have a history of uh, uh, harassment and violence and, and hyper-policing, uh, how do you um, deal with the question of public safety without it being punitive? And um, we, we see that that's a major issue now because of the way that the, the disease threatens all Americans and everyone in the United States and actually everyone in the globe. But when we're talking about um, the homeless, uh, communities that have been neglected, when we're talking about undocumented people, um, the ways in which we've treated them in the past in terms of governance then impacts the ways that uh, we can implement interventions 
to make sure that the disease doesn't spread. And so um, there has to be a way to um, uh, think about those issues together. So you've done some work, as I understand it, um, on programs to support police training and police education that are, as I understand, you have to tell me sort of in the direction of helping police have um, more systemic understandings of um, economic injustice, um, social inequities and things like that so that they can be more knowledgeable in their engagement with um, communities uh, where people are in marginal economic situations and things like that. Um, is there anything from the work that you've done in that space of police training that seems to you important um, to help us all think about how policing might evolve um, under COVID conditions? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of the interventions that are going on in, in the most progressive police uh, departments across the country have to do with the realization that uh, the police are not the ones who are best equipped to solve every uh, social problem. And yet they're called to solve problems that they're not trained to solve. And so uh, there's different interventions across the country when it comes to issues of mental health, for instance, uh, or um, um, issues of even um, drug use in which uh, we found that, you know, locking up people is not going to solve that problem. And so the, I think that the problem more generally, uh, or the danger of policing in the time of COVID is that we're presented with the problem and that the only way that we know how to solve it is through a punitive uh, way of sanctioning people. But in the age of COVID, punitive measures, um, everyone that we've imagined would only um, exacerbate the problem. And so uh, we need to find uh, more kind of public health interventions that uh, expand uh, care and expand the safety net to vulnerable populations. And I think that's the only way that we're going to kind of make headway on the issue. So that's interesting. I think lots of people in the criminal justice reform space have been arguing for a spell that we needed to transition from a penal lens for thinking about a set of social challenges to a health lens. Right. Um, and it sounds as if part of what you're saying is that the COVID crisis really brings that point into the starkest possible relief. Um, and so then it's in that regard, maybe a moment where we should be collectively um, working on how to build out that health response to um, social challenges and um, in negative impacts in communities of marginalization. But this is a chance to really um, detail what that health uh, infrastructure should be. Um, so I wanna open the conversation up. I think there's some questions that have been um, building up in the queue. Um, so I'm gonna invite Ronnie to hop, hop in and um, and share some questions. Hi, uh, thank you. I think uh, we're also getting some uh, more emotional responses in the Q and A, but I'll, I'll limit myself to the reading out some of the questions we've gotten. Well, uh, I could share some of the emotion too. I think this is a. I mean, I was honestly thinking that as I was talking to Lawrence. I mean, this is a really hard and painful topic, and here I am, sort of sitting here. Act, you know, speaking analytically, being a scholar about it, and that it mode is not actually sufficient, in all honesty, for the phenomena we're talking about. So, um, if you feel like it, don't hesitate to share. I mean, they're not they're not um, very detailed, but things like powerful and just kind of right. people are, are uh, commenting as we go along. So, I have a very interesting question here. Uh, has a few parts to it. So. Um, you say at the end of the video and in the book that what underlies and makes torture possible is fear. So could you talk a bit about that and some counter examples to that, right? John Burge didn't seem afraid, he seemed sadistic and to enjoy a sense of invulnerability. How does this connect with the fear you think is important to understand? Uh, it seems uh, to this questionnaire, 
that it is um, fear is manufactured and designed to further inequality and relations of domination. Do you agree? What do you suggest um, that fear? Um, why do you suggest that fear is a kind of bottom line? Um, yeah, I mean, I think fear uh, at its root is about the unknown. Uh, I think fear is also about, um, in our country, it has a lot to do with innocence. I think there's a, uh, there's an idea that certain people in society need, it, need are innocent and therefore need to be protected and then other people uh, are, we should be afraid of them and they're not worthy of protection. In fact, we should put them away, lock them up, and they're disposable. And the reason why it revolves around these ideas and this idea of fear to me is because the people who are tortured in Chicago, it, it, it's not an accident uh, who they were. Not only were they uh, mostly disproportionately African-American men, they were also African-American men who uh, a lot of times had previous interactions with the criminal justice system. And so uh, part of John Burge's calculus was that no one would care about these people and no one would believe them. And that our collective uh, fear of them would allow him, him to get away with what he, he got away with. And so when I talk about fear, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, the individual actions of Burge. I'm talking about the reason why everyone in the U.S. isn't up in arms and everyone in the U.S. isn't speaking out about uh, collective injustice. Should we take another question? Sure, go for it, yeah. All right, so um, another question is, um, was there something special about Chicago that made the scale of police torture worse? Or was there something special about what happened in Chicago that led to the eventual recognition of the problem? Um, well, I think that, uh, I think in terms of just the size and the population of Chicago and the, the history of activism in Chicago, as well as police abuse in Chicago, um, contributed to both uh, the torture and also why we know about it. But I think that similar things have taken place across the country. And I think that there's similar open secrets that go on uh, in terms of uh, police torture along this spectrum and continuum that I talk about that are often unacknowledged. And so while Chicago is an example, I don't think that what I talk about is limited to Chicago. And so part of what I want to use the book to say is that although this happens in Chicago, what prevents it from happening anywhere else in the country? And this is why I also spend a lot of time talking about the, the incentives that are embedded in the world of policing and the structure of governance um, that um, incentivizes people to stay silent about uh, something like police violence, because I'm also making the argument that this could happen anywhere. And it's just the case that we don't know the extent of it, uh, because uh, maybe they weren't as egregious as Burge, or maybe um, maybe um, some of the players are, are still keeping the secret under wraps. But there's no reason why it couldn't happen anywhere else. One of the things that's incredibly powerful in your book is the way in which you um, really bring to the surface um, sort of quite troubling and problematic moral intuitions that many people um, just operate with routinely. So for example, you end up saying explicitly, you know, not even black and brown people deserve to be tortured. <laughs> and then you say, not even guilty black and brown people deserve to be tortured. And the fact that you have to say that explicitly, right, speaks to your point that there's a certain um, looking away because um, collectively we um, cease to 
um, in our own hearts and spirits afford full moral protections and sort of basic human rights to guilty people and particularly guilty black and brown people. And it's in that failure of all of us to um, just as a matter of consistent commitment um, afford full protections of human rights, expect to afford full protections of human rights, even to guilty people um, that we end up with a society where these kinds of things are done. So at the end of the day, the book is as much of a, uh, an exhortation to all of us um, to examine our own consciences um, as it is a kind of exposure of the open secrets of the city of Chicago. Um, so I think that's probably what you're saying too with a point about fear. Um, is that fair, Lawrence? Yeah, exactly. And I think it relates to the question of COVID as well, because I mean, I think part of what has been happening in these conversations about uh, expanding the the public health capacity and public safety capacity uh, in our cities beyond the police is that there's this idea that um, when you talk about a, a drug user, for example, and finding an intervention for someone who's addicted to drugs that isn't incarceration, that they're addicted to drugs because of their own moral failure, right? Uh, and so a lot of what we think about as crimes is connected to individual moral failings of people. But it cannot be argued that COVID is connected to uh, an individual moral failure. And so we can, it frees us up to think about an expanded uh, public safety apparatus beyond policing uh, because it's very powerful to condemn people based on this idea of guilty versus innocence. Thank you, yes. Um... So we have a, a follow-up question on, um, on this idea, on, on the kind of incentives in the police and uh, policing structures, right? Uh, so with respect to police torture and the unacknowledged reality and willful blindness surrounding it, what do you see as the drivers or institutional incentives for living the lie rather than addressing the living injustice? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the book, I, I uh, look closely at the John Burgess precinct and I look at officers who were in John Burgess precinct at the time that torture was going on. And these officers were uh, mostly African-American the ones that I talk about were mostly African American. And so they were excluded from John Burge's inner circle. And yet they still didn't um, openly uh, talk about torture. And not only that, they worked very hard to keep themselves ignorant of knowledge of torture because they didn't want to be able to talk about it. And so I, I call that like learning to know what not to know. They developed a very sophisticated way to stay ignorant. When someone was coming in uh, who they suspected was going to be abused, they went the other way. When they heard a noise coming out of an interrogation room, they took time off. And so uh, they kept themselves ignorant of, of what was going on, even though they heard these rumors. And so um that's one way that we shield ourselves and and the reason why people do that is because it maintains their job security it maintains their pensions it allows them to move up in the ranks and there were some people who blew the whistle of of, of torture at the time and those people were demoted and they were uh given the worst kind of jobs and so it was the people who either were directly involved or who uh, figured out a way to become ignorant about torture uh, were the ones who were most secure in their jobs. Yes. So, uh, for one more question, I think, Ronnie. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna combine a few questions that are all kind of mm -hmm. forward facing. So, a kind of general question: What role, if any, should police play in a more just society? So this is kind of the question of this ambivalence around um, kind of abolish the police or actually find different ways um, to reform it. And another question is: uh, 
kind of the future with regards to COVID, are we going to observe increasing digital or AI forms of policing, stop and frisk uh, in the future? Um, so the, these kinds of uh, technologies seem to be exacerbated because of COVID. And then there was a more personal question to you, um, which is kind of how, how this research has impacted you personally and uh, how it might be affecting your next project. So why don't why don't you feel my Lawrence? I'm gonna I'm gonna pick I'm gonna pick um, okay. there. There's lots of rich and important stuff, but if you could maybe speak to that question about um, well, what what would more just policing look like, and then answer the question about how the, it's, this work has personally affected you. Um, I think those would be wonderful questions for us to um, to, to focus on for the conclusion. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody for those uh, wonderful and generous questions. Um, I think. In the best case scenario, I think that we uh, we can develop a way to um, kind of expand the the safety network around uh, crisis and and people in need without again it, it resulting in being punitive. I think part of what the book will show is that one of the barriers to that will be the history of police violence and the way that that history uh, lives with us in the present. And so um, when you look at um, other places like uh, places like China right now who are using these technologies to scan temperatures when people go into a building or, or something like that and to really take stock of um, how the disease is moving throughout society, which we will have to do if we need, if we're going to get a handle on COVID, um, a, a major barrier to that will be the idea of surveillance and, and security and the lack of legitimacy, uh, particularly for vulnerable populations. And so uh, the future of policing is to, uh, to extend care without punishment. And so um, that's what we're gonna have to do. And, and that's what, where other forms of governments and other forms of intervention uh, beyond police uh, come into play. Uh, in terms of how this uh, book has affected me, um, I think there's been a lot of intimate conversations that people in Chicago have shared with me about their experiences. And uh, the thing about writing a letter is that it invites a response and it necessitates that you also uh, become vulnerable and share your own experiences. And so I've thought a lot about my own vulnerabilities um, and my own interactions and encounters with the police throughout my life and um, and it, from my childhood to the to present day and I think it's um, really uh, made me think about scholarship and what scholarship is for in a different way and and that is to really impact people's lives and and to uh, be bold enough as academics to take an ethical stance on the urgent social problems of our day. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for those eloquent thoughts and also for your book, which I cannot recommend highly enough. I do encourage everybody to go get a copy, Torture Letters, um, and it's University of Chicago Press. Thank you again, Lawrence, for joining us. Thank you, Ronnie. It's been terrific to have this conversation this evening. And thank you, everybody who was um, participating today. We will see you soon. Take care. <laughs>